Great, thank you for the nice introduction. I'm very honored to be talking in this webinar series, and I will talk about how does the Arctic affect our weather or the weather in the North Atlantic region, because um, more specifically the influences of freshwater, because freshwater is an important link between the Arctic and the North Atlantic, and a lot of the ice that melts in the Arctic ends up in the North Atlantic as freshwater, and there it leads to changes in the ocean and atmospheric circulations. But before I start, I'm interested in hearing what you actually think, how much fresh water enters the, the North Atlantic from, from sea ice, or no, this is just from land ice, so how much fresh water from Greenland and the Canadian archipelago enters the, um, enters the ocean on average. So this is um, just the representative value for the last 10 to 15 years, this value has increased a lot, but how much do you think, how much fresh water is discharged just due to melt or land ice. So this does not include the sea ice in the Arctic Ocean. This only includes land ice. So the results should be up on everyone's screen now. Great. Um, so very close. A lot of you got it um, right. So the right answer is over a thousand kilometers cubed, although this value has fluctuated. But on average, it's now over a, over a thousand kilometers cubed per, per year. And that's a very large value. And it does not even include the sea ice and the freshwater that um, reaches the North Atlantic through through, through Fram Straits, so, so that's the, from the Arctic Ocean. And um, the value over a thousand, that's more than twice the global, fresh, global domestic freshwater supply. So it's a very large value, but it's worth noting that it's not, um, it's not the, not just, um, so not all of the freshwater really enters the central subpolar region where it leads to changes in the ocean circulation. A lot of the freshwater enters the, enters the ocean in the boundary current around Greenland, and then it flows around Greenland and it, it, it flows further south and it does not reach the subpolar region. However, some of the freshwater does reach the subpolar region. So um, this is shown here. Um, this is uh, observations from a mooring which we had in the Erminger Sea. This is just southeast of Greenland. And um, this was a very warm summer in 2010. This shows the sea surface temperature anomaly compared to all other summers. And we see that the observations of the mooring, they, um, which is from summer to winter, is first we have a very fresh surface layer. So this is an salinity. It's in grams of salt per kilograms of fresh water. So blue means we have less salt or more fresh water. And in the summer, it was very warm, but then it cooled. Um, and the fresh water, it didn't mix because the, the stratification was very strong and prevented the, the water from mixing down. So by this, um, by having more fresh water, we can reach um, lower sea surface temperatures before the water eventually mixes down. And this is an important effect on the atmosphere because if we have a colder sea surface, then this leads also, can also lead to changes in the atmosphere. And that's mainly the inference that I will show you in this um, presentation. And that was also the motivation of this study. And I will um, focus on two types of freshwater winds, one that is due to enhanced runoff and melting, and one that results from circulation changes in the subpolar and Arctic region. So we can have more freshwater because more freshwater melts over green, more ice melts over Greenland, and, um, and also the surrounding ocean and the surrounding continents. But we can also have changes in the freshwater because the, um, more of the freshwater actually reaches the interior ocean circulation. Um, we can also have other factors influencing the freshwater like precipitation, but um, oh, for the influences that I'm going to show you, we found that only these type of freshwater ones really matter. So the first freshwater event is due to runoff and melt, so overall warmer weather. And for that, we use an index, which we call FNA, um, and that is the negative NAO in, in July and August. July and August are the peak runoff months, and um, this index is associated with an overall increased sea level pressure over Greenland. So it's overall warmer, warmer weather in this region. And we also noted that it's associated with an enhanced cooling rate from summer to winter, which is shown here. So we always have a cooling from summer to winter, but when this index is enhanced, we have an enhanced cooling rate. 
And we then we investigated this cooling further and we did a surface mass balance and investigated all the possible terms that could contribute the, to the cooling, especially the surface fluxes with the atmosphere. And we found that um, only the freshwater can actually explain the cooling. So the mechanism by which it influences the sea surface temperature is that if we have more freshwater, then the amount of freshwater determines the temperature that the surface water is required to have before the freshwater can be mixed down. So actually Actually, we use the influence of the freshwater on the SST to infer its variability. And that is very useful because we have long-term sea surface temperature observations from satellites and not so long observations from, from sea surface salinities. However, we notice that um, the observations we have are very consistent with this index and we find that um, also this support the surface mass balance. So showing that this index is actually a good indicator of the freshwater that, that results due to melting. Um, the problem with freshwater anomalies is just that if we only have small freshwater anomalies, then the freshwater is mixed down before it can actually influence the SST or before it leads to cold anomalies in winter. So we found that there is a threshold above which um, the freshwater has a strong influence on the SST. And this um, threshold occurs around 0 0.4, 0 0.5. And above this um, threshold, we get a very strong response. So if we have um, values above this, then a little further increase in the freshening leads to very strong freshwater anomalies in the, in the subpolar region. So here we see the freshwater anomaly, and this is the sea surface salinity again, um, associated with this index when it exceeds this threshold. So we get very strong freshwater anomalies and also very strong cold anomalies in this region. And um, we have a sharp associated with that is the sharp sea surface temperature gradient from south to north. And this shows the, um, the sea surface temperature gradient in relative to the index. So this is the winter following the freshwater event. This is averages from January through to March over three months. So if we have an increased index, um, we have um, increase in the sea surface temperature gradient and we, we see this asymmetry. And in the first part of the talk, I will only focus on these events, on these strong freshwater events. Um, and in the second part of the talk, I will focus on the other side. So let's start with the first slide again. So this is the sea surface temperature gradient associated with these, with these large freshwater events. We get a sharp sea surface temperature front and that's an important signal for the atmosphere because it leads to an increased atmospheric instability. And that's usually expressed, expressed by means of the ED growth rate, which is, which is shown here. So when this is increased, this means that the atmosphere is more unstable. It's the main source of baroclinic instability in, in the atmosphere. So um, we get a circulation from this that looks like that. So we have a cyclonic circulation over Greenland and a more anti-cyclonic circulation to the south. So this is also the um, circulation that we expect from theory, because if we have an air parcel, that travels northward across the front, then it is warmer than the surrounding air. So the air, so it rises and the air column stretches and then it acquires cyclonic vorticity. And the opposite occurs when it travels southward. So it's consistent with the observations. And um, this is also very similar to a positive NaO phase, which is um, very interesting because it su suggests that the most negative NaO summers are followed by a positive NaO in, in winter. And this is also associated with uh, strong westerly winds or strong jet stream. So this shows the wind speed and the, also all in the subsequent winter, um, the wind speed associated with this atmospheric pattern. And we have um, very strong winds. Um, these are at 700 hectopascal, but we also have them at the surface. And this um, is indicative of a very strong jet stream in this region, which influences also the weather over the surrounding continents. So for an, as an example, here we have a very strong storm in December 2015 that was after the largest freshwater event that we had. And we have a very deep cyclone over Greenland, which is here, and then very strong winds. So it's very representative for the regressions that I just showed you. So it's very typical signature that we expect from, from strong freshwater events. And we have um, this particular storm was also associated with um, very cold, air advection on the western side of the cyclone. So it was southward flowing air from, the, from, the, um, from Alaska over the US. And then we had very cold air um, over the US, um, minus four Fahrenheit or minus 20 degrees centigrade and very warm air over the North Pole because this was on the other side of the, of the cyclone, actually above freezing air temperatures in midwinter over the North Pole, which was very unusual. And then over the UK, we had a lot of flooding events 
um, because it was just on the path of these strong winds. So it caused about 1.9 billion damage. It had very severe effects. And this is just one example. It was an extreme, extreme example of, um, of such a storm or what these uh, weather conditions actually mean for, for the weather over the surrounding continents. However, they not only influence the weather, these um, cyclones or these influences of, um, of fresh water, it's not only influence the weather over the surrounding continents, they also influence the ocean circulation. And that is shown here. So here we have again the sea level pressure anomaly um, in the subsequent winter um, following large freshwater events. And we have an um, increased convergence. So this shows the Ackman transport, the arrows, in the region of, so in the subtropical region. And this increased convergence leads to an increased sea level height, which is shown here by means of the absolute dynamic topography. And in the northern hemisphere, increased sea level height means we have a more anticyclonic circulation. So if we integrate over all these anticyclonic eddies that we have associated with this uh, circulation pattern, then um, we get a more anticyclonic circulation. Um, and this also corresponds to the region that is usually between the subtropical and the subpolar gyre. So here we have the subpolar gyre, and here we have the subtropical gyre. And um, this is the location of the North Atlantic current. And, um, when we have a more, more anticyclonic circulation on top of this North Atlantic current, which is shown by the thick arrow, then this is equivalent to having an enhanced eastward flow at the northern edge and a reduced eastward flow at the southern edge. So it's like a northward shift of this current. Actually, earlier studies also refer to this circulation as intergyre gyre circulation because it sits between the two gyres. So we have a, a northward shift of this of this North Atlantic current, and that's also why we see it as a warm anomaly. So it's not that the water in this current is necessarily warmer, but it flows at a more northerly location. So we see it as a warm anomaly in the sea surface temperature field. And um, this usually, since in the first, we also see it already in the first winter after the freshwater event, but the cold anomaly still covers the North Atlantic current. So it's better seen in the second winter after the freshwater event. So this is why we have a plus two here. So this is, um, so these are all averages over winter from January through to March in the first and second winter. However, we also see these influences in summer. And this is shown here. So these are now averages in summer from May through to August over four months. And this shows the um, averages over the first summer and this over the second summer. So in the first summer after the event, the SST field is still dominated by the, sea, by the cold anomaly. Whereas in the second summer, we see this northward shift of the North Atlantic current as the warm anomaly. And like in winter, we get an increased atmospheric instability and a shift in the jet stream. It's just that in summer, the situation is a little different because we also have a strong sea surface temperature gradient across the coast because the land heats up faster. So um, when the jet stream turns further north, it, um, it, it's like a, um, the sea surface temperature front acts like a guide for the jet stream and it directs the jet stream around Europe. So Europe is more shielded from the moist maritime air of the, of the North Atlantic and we get warm and dry anomalies over the continent. So this shows the two meter air temperature over Europe and this is the precipitation minus evaporation anomalies. So we have positive temperature anomalies and negative precipitation anomalies. So we have more droughts after increased freshwater events. And um, in all of these cases, both in winter and in summer, we know that the amplitude of these regressions is very high. So the slope of the regression is very steep, which means that um, once the freshwater exceeds this critical threshold of not being mixed down anymore, a relatively small further increase is linked to very large atmospheric responses. And that's um, also seen on this slide. So here we have, again, the warm and the dry anomalies. And when we average over the region and close by the 95 confidence lines, we see that um, this actually corresponds to a, um, the, the temperature change between a weak and a strong event is more than two standard deviations. So this is um, the distance between the solid and the dashed line corresponds to one standard deviation, whereas the, the um, index only changes um, or the freshening associated with this index is only 0.0. .0 five or to 0 0.06 gram per kilogram. And that's only 0 0.7 standard deviation. So a relatively small change in the freshening um, leads to a very large change in the atmosphere. And that's a problem for models because models usually don't capture fresh water. So this shows an example um, where we compare the re ocean reanalysis echo with agro fluid observations. And the blue dots mean that agro observed fresher water, whereas um, the red dots mean that aqua observed fresher water. So um, 
we have mostly blue dots in this region where the fresh water enters the subpolar region, which indicates there may be a problem of the model where the fresh water, yeah, and the seasonal freshening associated with these um, with with these events. So this is um, shows an example from from a fresh winter 2015 to 2016, which was very fresh, and um, the the model underestimated the freshening. And what is striking is that um, it um, underestimated the freshening quite a lot. So this is 0.3 grams per kilogram. And um, this is not unusual. So other um, studies who looked at the freshwater variability and models find that uh, a um, bias of 0.3 grams per kilogram is quite common about in model in global climate models um, like the um, like the CMF5 and the CMF6 models. So it's um it's not not unusual. Um, but this is a problem because um, as I mentioned earlier, the difference in the um, in the, the dish between a weak and a strong event is just 0.05 grams per kilogram. So um, the the difference um, that or the bias in the model and this that this seasonal freshening indicates um, is one is five times larger than the accuracy that would be required to predict a two to four standard deviation change in the atmospheric circulation. So um, something like the difference between the warmest and the coldest summer or the wettest and the driest summer. So in other words, models don't capture these events and they are also not close to capturing. So we're currently not making use of this potential predictability. Um, and by the way, Aqua actually assimilated the Argo data. So it knew that the freshwater was there, but it was it decided it's too inconsistent with the, the other model fields. So it decided that it must be wrong and it simulated then more saline water there. But okay, these were only a few events, and I mentioned earlier that we also have circulation-induced freshwater events, but um, for this we use a different index, which is the Arctic Oscillation, and this is very similar to the North Atlantic Oscillation, but it has a center more over the Arctic Ocean. And the main motivation for using this index is that it, um, it's as previous studies have found that it's associated with enhanced Ackman transport of freshwater in the boundary currents, so more freshwater can reach the subpolar region, and also it's associated with an increased wind stress current in the subpolar region that can also lead to an enhanced advection of freshwater from the boundary current into the interior. So next we test this index, whether it's really working, and so I'm showing you um, the same regressions that I showed with the FNA index, just with the AO index now, and we find again the same asymmetry. So when we regress this index on the positive, uh, on the negative AO index, so this is more similar to the positive FNA index since the FNA index was a negative NAO and the NAO and the AO are very well correlated. Then we again get the cold anomalies that we have already seen um, or the events are also included here. It's a very similar signature. We have a cold anomaly here, but um, we also get cold anomalies when we regress it in the positive direction on, on positive um, AO values. So um, these are completely different. They were initiated by the opposite atmospheric circulation pattern in summer, but we still get cold anomaly. So we next investigate these cold anomalies. Um, and it's important to note that the following um, the following regressions refer to a different set of years, and they were preceded by the opposite atmospheric pattern in summer. So next we look at these cold anomalies. When we do a surface mass balance, we again find that these cold anomalies are associated with freshwater events, but there are some differences now. This shows the freshwater anomaly in December, so in December following the freshwater event, and um, this is because the cold anomalies again lead to a dipolar atmospheric circulation, but in this case the atmospheric circulation in the winter, again averaged from January through to March, um, is associated with an increased ocean heat loss. So blue means that the ocean loses more heat. And that means that the, the atmosphere actually contributes to the cold anomaly and contributes to the cooling. So, and um, it actually mixes the freshwater down in the course of the winter. But if we look at the evolution of the heat fluxes and the sea surface temperature anomaly, we have first the cold anomaly. So first we have this freshwater induced cold anomaly, which is um, shown here. And um, the heat fluxes are initially positive. So first the ocean drives the atmosphere. First we have the cold anomaly that leads to changes in the atmosphere, but then the atmosphere responds and the heat fluxes change sign. And then they contribute to the cooling, mix the fresh water down, but maintain the cold anomaly because they are associated with an increased ocean heat loss. So um, this is an 
uh, that was different for the other type of freshwater wind where the heat fluxes were not coinciding with the region of the cold anomaly and did not really matter. So it was the, the ocean driving the atmosphere all the time. So um, again, we have, so these were all averages in winter that I showed you here, but now we again look at the atmospheric and ocean setting in summer. So in summer, we still see the cold anomaly, but we also have a, a shift in the, in the North Atlantic current again, um, driven by the wind stress. And that, um, so this shows the absolute dynamic topography. And this um, leads to a change in the jet stream, which is um, shown by the, by the um, arrows here. So we have a more northward advection around Europe. And again, we get warm and dry anomalies over Europe in the subsequent summer. So the amplitudes are smaller compared to the other type of freshwater events. But these, um, the threshold for reaching, initiating these events is also much lower. So these are based on a lot more, a lot more events, almost 20. Or over 20 actually. So if we summarize this chain of events, we first have a strong freshwater event. This leads to cold anomalies in winter, which trigger an enhanced storminess in the subpolar region, which then lead to a shift in the North Atlantic current and a shift in the summer, which then leads to a shift in the summer jet stream. And this leads to warm and dry anomalies over Europe. So this is a very idealized chain. Um, I skipped some feedbacks, but it explains um, to a first order very well the changes that we observe in the, in, over the North Atlantic and, and the climate variability. Um, we can also, I started from the freshwater event and then um, they resulted in warm and dry anomalies over Europe, but we can also do it the other way around and start from why warm and dry anomalies over Europe and look at the associated ocean and atmospheric conditions. So when we do that, this is um, a composite of um, strong heat events over Europe, strong warm summers, and this shows the temperature variability just in this region, detrended de because otherwise we would just see a lot of peaks in, in recent years. And then we did a composite of these on the associated jet stream. So we again found they are also associated with this, um, with this jet stream shift and also associated with um, fresh and cold anomalies. And um, we can look at them individually because there are actually large differences. So this is just an um, example of three, three warm summers. These were the three warmest summers over Europe. And this shows that there are actually a lot of differences between them. Um, here, the cold anomaly extended really far to the south. And um, then the jet stream meander, which is shown here, also occurred for the south and the warm anomaly over Europe occurred to the south. Whereas um, for the other events, the, the, here the cold anomaly occurred for the north and then the jet stream meander was further north and the warm anomaly over Europe was more over central Europe. And then in 2018, we had this northward shift of the North Atlantic current. So um, everything was further north as well. And the warm anomaly then occurred over Northern Europe. So there are these differences, um, but um, we find that generally all, um, all cold anomalies over, over the North Atlantic region are linked to some, in some way to a freshwater event in the preceding summer. And all warm anomalies over Europe are linked to a cold anomaly in the, in the North Atlantic um, region. However, the link between, it's worth pointing out that the link between the initial freshwater event and the final warm anomaly over Europe is not always linear because we can have, it also depends on the location of the freshwater event and, and other factors. So these are just some examples. So next I would like to show you an example of a very strong circulation induced freshwater event, which was the strongest circulation induced freshwater event that has been observed. And it's not included in the regressions I showed you earlier because it occurred before the period of the satellite observations. It occurred in the 60s and 70s. And it was so strong that um, it was associated with a temporary shutdown of ocean convection. So in the subpolar region here, we have um, important ocean convection centers. And usually what happens, the freshwater converges in this region because the convection centers of regions of flow con surface flow convergence, and then the freshwater mixes down in the course of the winter. So each winter we reach a point where the freshwater actually mixes down and the system resets for the freshwater event in the next year. But this freshwater event was different and the freshwater actually remained at the surface throughout the winter and led to a very strong cold anomaly. So the, the total freshwater event lasted for eight years, but the temporary shutdown of ocean convection lasted for three years. And when, um, when this, um, when the freshwater was finally mixed down, but we still had this, um, this freshwater event, the freshwater inflow going on, we had extreme cold anomalies in the subpolar region, which are shown here. These are averages over five winters from January through to March, so a um, very long period. And 
associated with that, again, the, the, the typical cyclonic anomaly over Greenland. And um, this was associated with very strong storms. So act, these, um, these winters were associated with some of the most severe winter conditions, weather conditions in, in this region. So it was a very, very strong event and it also had a lot of strong influences. So when the cold anomaly finally retreated and um, the shift in the North Atlantic current appeared, um, this also led to a shift in the jet stream and the warm anomaly over Europe. And that was one of the warmest summers that Europe has ever had. So even though we have broken this record now and over the recent years several times because of this increased warming trend, um, at that time it was very impressive and it's still impressive. It still stands out as one of the warmest summers that Europe has ever had. So it was a really, really large event large freshwater event. And what was so special about this event is that it was attributed to a switch of the Arctic gyre regime from anticyclonic to cyclonic. So the Arctic gyre is uh, special in that it can have these two different regimes and the, in the mean it's always anticyclonic, but um, it can be more, more anticyclonic or more cyclonic. And when it is more anticyclonic, then it accumulates a lot of fresh water. And when it is um, more cyclonic, the fresh water is released. And in the way this circulation is driven is also driven by the atmosphere and by the Arctic oscillation. So if we integrate the Arctic oscillation over a longer time period, if it's very, if it's positive, it leads to more cyclonic circulation. And um, what's what's interesting is that we've had these switches in the Arctic gyre regime fairly regularly every five to eight years prior to the 90s. And that was an important contributor to the North Atlantic climate variability. But since the 90s, the Arctic gyre has been stuck in an anti anti-cyclonic regime. And this was also the time when we had most of the melt-induced freshwater events. So while this Arctic gyre has now been stuck in this anti-cyclonic regime, it has accumulated a lot of freshwater because this is also the period that co corresponds to the enhanced Arctic amplification. So the Arctic warms faster than the rest of the world. So it had, um, not only it had more time to accumulate freshwater, but it was also warmer. So there was also more freshwater to accumulate. So if this freshwater would get released, it would trigger a massive, a massive freshwater event. And um, this, um, this increased, um, this increased warming or the increased freshwater is a, uh, is also shown here by the runoff anomaly of Greenland. This just gives an indication of the of the overall warming. So during the Great Salinity anomaly, the runoff over Greenland was only about 60% of the average runoff over the last 20 years. So this is what you estimated in the beginning. And this value has been fluctuating, but over it has in, over the last years it was very 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 large compared to the earlier period. And this is although this is only Greenland runoff, so this does not even dis include discharge. Um, but it, uh, it still shows that it was associated with warmer, that we have now warmer, warmer weather, warmer climate and more fresh water. And that we also expect this warming over the Arctic. So we also have more fresh water in the Arctic Ocean. And there are several studies who have observed this fresh water. So over the last 20 years, there, there are several observational com campaign, campaigns that monitor the fresh water in the Arctic Ocean and they see this increase. So um, there is a lot of fresh water now. And this, um, this uh, increased um, increased runoff that we see now, that also means that now we have a larger seasonal freshening cycle than at the time of the Great Salinity Anomaly. So this shows um, the Argo and Mooring observations in this region, which is again is the deep convection region. And as I mentioned earlier, each time in winter the fresh water is mixed down at some point. But we are now in a, at a, in a regime where we have so much runoff and so much melting that in some winters, actually the time for, fre for fresh water to be mixed down is relatively short. And um, we still mix it down every winter, which is better seen in the, in the potential temperature profiles. But, um, but the, yeah, the, if we don't have much convection, then um, the risk that fresh water can remain at the surface uh, increases. And if we have a temporary shutdown of convection again, this means that um, because of a large freshwater event, then not only the freshwater event would be larger, but also we would keep adding more freshwater in the meantime um, while we have this convective shutdown. So it could be a very, very strong freshwater event. It would be very exciting. And what's interesting is that um, it looks like um, we may have a, a switch in the Arctic gyre circulation sometime soon because these melt induced freshwater events that I showed you earlier give actually rise to a more cyclonic ocean and atmospheric circulation in the Arctic. So this is shown here. These are again regressions in summer on the sea level, so the sea level pressure on this freshwater index when it exceeds that threshold. And um, 
This, so these are both in summer and we see we have a more cyclonic atmospheric circulation. So these melt induced fresh water winds are actually associated with a negative feedback on the melt induced freshening, but a positive feedback on the circulation induced freshening. And we all can also see that in the Arctic gyre circulation, where this is absolute dynamic topography. So this means we have an increased pressure gradient from the inside to the outside, which means in the interior, the circulation is more cyclonic or less anti-cyclonic. And um, after the large freshwater event in 2015, in 2017, then we had for the first time in over 20 years, a cyclonic atmospheric circulation uh, averaged over the year uh, in the Arctic. So for the first time in over 20 years, um, we had uh, this cyclonic and more cyclonic circulation. And this Arctic gyre circulation reached a minimum. So it almost came to a halt or it almost switched the regime, but then it recovered. However, since we have these very high sensitivities to small variations in the fresh water, um, it may just take a slightly larger event than the one we've had in 2015 to trigger such a change in, in, the, in the circulation. So um, it would be, um, yeah, it would be an exciting event if then this fresh water could potentially be released. So, um, but we don't know how close we are and what exactly will happen because, as I mentioned earlier, climate models still have difficulties to capture this. So, but yeah, it will be very exciting. So to conclude, um, fresh wet heavens promote an enhanced storminess in winter and warmer and drier weather over Europe and summer. Um, once the freshening or the mud induced freshening exceeds the threshold, a small further increase is linked to a subst substantially larger response, and there is an increasing chance of a large Arctic freshwater release. And if this happens, if we would have a temporary shutdown, this means that um, the melt induced freshwater, since this is, uh, since we always have a, an enhanced seasonal freshening now due to more melt, could combine with, um, with this Arctic freshwater release. And um, yeah, this would, this would, however, mean that we would have a very large Arctic freshwater event. So thanks a lot for your attention. And I would also like to thank the, the funders of these projects, which are the European Co Commission um, with the Blue Action Project and the National Environmental Research Council with the Class and Access Projects. Thank you. Thank you so much for that really in-depth talk. That was a lot of information you found in there. Well done. Um, right, we've got a couple of questions already submitted. So we'll, what we're going to do is we'll work through those. Uh, for anyone who is on the call with us right now, then please just type in your question in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Uh, if you're joining us on YouTube, then type it in the live chat. We can monitor both uh, platforms for questions and um, yeah, let's get going. Oh, oh and this, this session is being recorded. So if anyone is unable to join us or wants to recap on anything that was mentioned today in the presentation, then please just check out the Master YouTube channel and you'll be able to find Marilena's uh, presentation there and this Q&A as well. So you can share it with anyone uh, who's interested or if you want to recap on anything that's been submitted. So uh, we're going to go straight into Mike's question. Uh, so Mike is asking, how important are subsurface conditions to the process you describe? For example, are gradients with depth in the mixed layer of temperature and salinity important? Yes. So um, the, um, overall, these, um, these, um, the stratification or the subsurface processes occur on longer timescales on more detailed variations, whereas the processes at the surface um, occur on shorter timescales. And we find that these have a much larger amplitude than the, than the changes below the surface. But we expect that on longer timescales, uh, for instance, the threshold below and above fresh water is mixed down can change because the subsurface water can also change the properties. However, on these timescales that we have investigated, these um, changes uh, appear to be not so significant. Um, yeah, we, um, although in theory they should be able to um, influence the threshold um, on these timescales, we found that they have the amplitude are just not, not it's just not large enough. So it was mostly influenced by the properties of the surface, surface freshwater. Excellent. Thank you so much for answering that question. Um, so Ruth's question is a little bit more of a clarification, uh, but it gives you a bit of, uh, more of a chance to expand maybe upon what you were summarizing, which is, um, are you suggesting there's a feedback loop? So fresh water equals warmer climate equals more fresh water equals an even warmer climate. Um, 
So there are actually a lot of negative feedbacks also involved in this. Um, we have, when we have more fresh water, we get more storms. So we get a colder surface anomaly. We have more storms in winter. And then those storms also um, mix the fresh water down. So that is a negative feedback. And also if we have um, in the subsequent summers, um, especially the second summer response, we get less melting or le less melt induced freshening and um, more, more circulation induced freshening. But again, this is a negative feedback. So I think that freshwater generally um, helps more in creating variability rather than a positive feedback loop. This is opposite to temperature. If we have increased sea surface temperatures, this usually leads to a more anticyclonic circulation. And then this, res this um, more anticyclonic circulation supports the sea surface temperature anomaly because it's associated with the reduced, reduced ocean heat losses. So we get a loop of positive feedbacks and further warming and freshwater, but this also leads to more freshwater then, and freshwater then breaks this positive feedback loop by creating cold anomalies. So I think freshwater is an important contributor to the North Atlantic climate variability by creating this negative feedbacks. However, what we have seen over the last years is that we have both an increased warming trend and an increased freshening trend, and in a way they compete with each other. And this, I think, also leads to some, um, that they are gauging each other in a way. We have more warming, this leads to larger freshwater events, but then we also get more cold, uh, stronger cold anomalies, stronger storms in winter, but also stronger negative feedbacks then. And um, we get uh, the shift in the North Atlantic current initiating a warm anomaly again. And this is because the water in the North Atlantic current is in the long run also warmer because of the global warming. Um, this leads to stronger warm anomalies again, stronger anticyclonic circulation and um, more stronger freshwater events again. So we have we also have more variability. We have not only higher amplitude of the variations, but also more vari variability now. And uh, most of the, the strongest extremes we have seen over the last years, they are, um, or they are in, over the last years, but they occur in both directions. So we have the most positive um, FNA indices, but also the most negative ones. And um, yeah, I think freshwater overall creates more variability and um, leads to, because of this, these negative feedbacks that it, it is associated with. Excellent, thank you. Hopefully that answers Ruth's question. That was a really good in-depth answer. Uh, we're gonna move to Graham's question, which is asking how close are we to being able to issue seasonal forecasts for the North Atlantic and Europe a year in advance? Um, so I would say at the moment we are in, we are not very close, and I think a problem is um, that. So there are studies that look into this in more detail, but um, I think a problem is a major problem is that freshwater is not very well captured by by forecasts. So usually these uh, seasonal and also beyond that forecasts are initialized by ocean reanalysis products. And if already in the in the ocean reanalysis there is an error in the freshwater, and if the error is large enough or the freshwater anomaly is large enough, it has it can really change the 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 evolution of the atmosphere quite a lot, and this leads to large biases in the in the predictive systems. So um, we are planning another study where we look at more at the influence. At, of this and see what um, what influence the freshwater has if we if we have a forecast initialized with that and without that, but currently um, there aren't really studies investigating this particular effect. Um, so generally, also I think there are a lot of studies suggest that the predictability of the North Atlantic is actually much higher than we currently make use of it and then then. Than we think, but um, but still, there it's a really interesting and active research subject of investigation, and I'm not um, familiar with all of these studies currently. But um, that is a process. The the freshwater process is an important process that is currently not captured, and that can lead to um, worse forecasts than we could actually have. So we can, if we use make better use of this predictive skill, we could potentially improve the forecasts. Awesome, thank you. Uh, our next question is asking, it seems that with ongoing melting of the Greenland ice sheet, there is definitely going to be an increase in meltwater inputs. So the changes that you're suggesting are more or less certain to happen. 
is there any possibility that this won't happen? Or are we pretty certain that it will? If so, do we have any timescales? Oh, this is a good question. So I think because we have so much um, fresh water now, and this is going to increase, and we have not observed it in the past, we don't know exactly what will happen. So we, we don't know if we can just extrapolate the regressions that I have shown you for larger freshwater events. Um, that's an open question. And since climate models have a lot of problems capturing these large freshwater events, we also don't know exactly what happens from these models. So it's really hard to get a definite answer. It's, I can just say from what we do know is that um, it is likely to happen that we have that we will have more freshwater, larger freshwater events, and we will have a switch in the Arctic gyre. Um, I think when we have this switch, it will take a t some time. There's usually a delay in it when it reaches the subpolar region. But I think we will have um, we will have a large freshwater and it will have substantial consequences for the North Atlantic climate. But um, it's really hard to say how exactly it will look. And um, I think eventually also the freshwater, it will lead to more storms and the freshwater will be mixed down again. But in the long run, we get larger and larger freshwater events. So after the next freshwater, we get another one, another one. So um, it's, um, yeah, I think it's, um, it should, um, it's hard to say something about timescales, but overall, uh, I would expect we get more extremes because of this. Um, and I'm, yeah, I'm pretty sh pretty certain that we, we will get larger freshwater events and associated with that larger, larger, stronger extreme events, more extremes. I see. Thank you very much. Uh, for, uh, right, we've reached the end of the questions that have come in so far. So if anyone who is still on our call, uh, all our attendees, I can see you there. Um, if you've got a question, then please pop it in the Q&A uh, box at the bottom of the screen. Now, I have a very basic question myself. I'm not an oceanographer. I'm just curious about actually how you got the data for some of this, uh, particularly the one that the anomaly that you mentioned in the 60s and 70s. How do we know that there was this huge dump of fresh water? I'm curious about that. I, yeah. The math's a bit straight over my head, but how do we know about these, these yeah, um, events? Yeah, for that particular event, we were quite lucky that is, uh, the data is obtained from the ocean weather ship Bravo. So this freshwater event was really well observed, actually. Um, the, the other observations, the recent ones, the hydrographic observations come from Argo and mooring data. So the Argo fluid started, uh, we, we started to get more and more and more data in the after 2002. So that's when we have a fairly good record of the, um, of the variability in the convective centers. The atmospheric data was based on, um, on the reanalysis ERA-5. Um, it's an atmospheric reanalysis product that assimilates a lot of observations. And that's um, it's very, um, very realistic for um, or compares well with the with the observations. Um, the the SST data was from satellites and also the absolute dynamic topography, which is the sea level height, it's also from satellites. Um, yeah, so it, a range of different data products. Yeah. No, thank you for answering that. That was just something I was curious about, particularly some of the older the older stuff that you were talking about, yeah. Um, yeah, wondering old, how we knew about it. Yeah, old um, historic freshwater observation or historic hydrographic observations in particular are not as as frequent as we would like it, and, but they are very valuable because they give us an idea of what happened a long time ago. Yeah, and that's absolutely. also why it's so important to for for the future to monitor the ocean very well now, so that we can say in future what what happens now. Yeah, and for people to, you know, share data, make it accessible so that everyone can, you know, yeah. uh, have a play around with it for whatever cause. Um, so we do have another question. It's from someone who's a bit more interested in about understanding how to even do climate modelling. You know, they're probably coming in with a bit more of a student background, but it'd be really great to have a little bit of your input on the question where they say, what's a good start for learning climate modelling? as a non-mathematical numerical mm -hmm. programming background. Um, I, I, I have a couple of ideas. I think YouTube's always a good place to even look, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, really great to have uh, your input on that, if, if at all. Yeah, so first thing to note, I think with climate models is that there are, um, there are different types of models. We have idealized models, which can be very simple, uh, very simple box models even. And we can have um, 
very complex um, coupled global climate models like the IPCC models, which are global. And there are, there are a lot of steps in between. So we can have models that just refer to different regions, but the global models are, are more complex and they have so much code in them. It's, um, it's also more difficult sometimes to understand their variability where simple models are often easier to interpret. And for that, um, so a good start is always to learn numerical methods. Um, and um, yeah, it all comes to math, uh, difference, finite difference equations. Um, um, it's, yeah, it's all based on, on math. So you have a lot of equations, um, yeah. a lot of physical, physical laws and that enter the model and um, programming, I mean, it's, yeah, it's mostly math, I would say. <laughs> yeah, and there's so much online help for anyone who's interested in doing some of this modeling. There are forums, web pages yeah. that really can help anyone troubleshoot a lot of these um, coding headaches that we all get now yeah. and then, uh, or at least for you to ask a platform uh, about a question as well. Um, yeah, I think there are also, it's different. So what you mean, so you're either understanding these models or developing these models mm. or just learning what they mean, the output means. So for that, you, you don't need to have, um, you don't need to understand all the mathematical or the pro programming background. Um, if you if you do more model analysis, uh, what what the output is about, or if you really try to 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 develop the models further, then you need a very good mathematical and programming background. Yeah. Right. Thank you so much. I think we've reached the end of our questions now. Um, I don't have any myself. So um, what I actually might ask you, uh, Marilena, is to just share your final slide again for any, so people can note down your email address if they want to get in contact with you. Um, so uh, if you want to kind of pick up a conversation directly with Marilena, then please just uh, drop her an email. It's on the screen right now. Uh, and you'll be able to, uh, you know, have a bit more of a in-depth conversation with her if there's something that you're wanting to find out more or just uh, chat to her about something that she spoke about. If you want to share this talk, then please check it out on the Mask YouTube channel. It's going to be there, including this Q&A. So feel free to share it with anyone or uh, recap on anything that was spoken about today, if you would like. So hopefully everyone's noted down uh, your email. You may get some, some stuff coming up in your inbox in the next day or so, hopefully. Yeah, feel free to contact me. Excellent. Um, thanks also for all your questions. No, thank you for being today's mass webinar presenter. Um, yeah, thank you. It was really great. And uh, thank you for everyone who is still with us. I just wanted to highlight to all our attendees who are still with us right now, what the next mass webinar is. So it's not next week. Unfortunately, we had a cancellation of a speaker, but it's going to be in two weeks time. So on the 26th of May, and it's Daniela Diz from Harriet Watt University. If this is something that you would like to learn more about, then just sign up on the same mass webinar sign up page that you did to join today's mass webinar. And just to highlight the talks that we have coming up in June, this is going to be our last month of webinars. So if there's something here that you would like to sign up and listen to and join the live Q&A for them, please check out the Mass YouTube, uh, not Mass YouTube, the Mass website, where you'll be able to find the sign up link for this month, which is uh, talks being done in conjunction with the EMBRC 